The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com. Hello and welcome back to The Ben Heck Show. Karen, do you remember a few episodes ago when we were working on mechanical television? Isn't that when we decided to not put a vinyl record in the laser cutter, which would have created toxic gas? Yes, we didn't do that, so good call. Anyway, in that episode, we got the flying spot scanner working so it would pick up an image from a subject, like a person talking. In this episode, we're gonna try and build the device that actually reproduces the image that's picked up. So we'll have two records, both not cut with lasers. We could try to get them to spin in sync by using a DC motor controller, and then see if we can get the image to transfer over to the imaging unit. Are there any other segments in today's episode? Yes, Felix is going to be talking about Linux. He will be installing Fedora, and we're gonna have you do some research for a future episode. Ah yes, the auto sanitizing UV doorknob cleaner. But for now, we've gotta finish the mechanical television. Let's get started. Amazing hacks. Where are my dragons? Inspired designs. Oh, look, I knocked some hot glue loose. Regrettable acting. I want to live in a world with Star Wars again! Each week, Element 14's The Ben Heck Show brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. All right, so in the previous episode of Mechanical Television, we set up a test using photoresistors. I've switched them to photodiodes, which should be a lot faster. I have them in parallel in this frame, and that white piece of material there is going to represent a person's face. So I have it hooked up to a pair of op amps, operational amplifiers, and one of them is acting as an amplifier and the other one is acting as a comparator. So I'll talk about the difference now. If you look in the scope, you can see three lines or you know traces. The first one, the yellow one, that is the signal basically coming off of the photodiodes. It's being amplified, but you can see the wave. That's actually the light coming off this fluorescent bulb because fluorescent bulbs have a frequency to them. If I turn off the light, and then replace it with a solid light like this LED. See how it's fairly steady? So the next thing I wanna show you is this. So the second op amp is set up as a comparator. So when I move this potentiometer, see how this teal, or I suppose it's more of a cyan trace, this is going to be the trigger point. So once this goes past the light level, see how the purple one, or it's actually more of a magenta, see how it changes? Okay, so that's acting as a comparator. So once the input signal goes past this cyan level, it will trigger the output of the second op amp. Although I seem to have it reversed, so it's acting as an inverter right now. I'll switch it around and we should get the right result. So this um, third one down here, that's going to actually be our light that reproduces the image, hopefully. Let me switch it around. It shouldn't only take a second and see if it goes the right way. Okay, so what I'm doing here is I've put the trigger point at the just above. See how it's just above the light level? I'll put it, there's it way above, but it needs to be just above. So now when when light appears on the board, it should trigger it. Okay, yeah, see how the other one jumps? So that's the comparator in action. So we're probably not gonna get an analog value or a brightness value, but we should at least get on and off just to prove the concept. This flashlight comes with a flicker thing, which is actually pretty convenient for using it on the scope because I can see both states on the scope. That's totally why I bought this flashlight. All right, well, I'm gonna dial this in a little bit more and see if I can get a more consistent reading from it, and then we can use this to build a circuit or build the circuit onto a PCB, I should say. Okay, I've set up a flying spot sensor using the photodiodes and I built a circuit here and it has a threshold when we go from light to dark. I know it's kind of hard to see, but you just have to trust me. So I have the op amp set to trigger at the edge of a brightness change. This is exactly how it was in the 1920s. I go down to the white one, down to the black, white. So you can see the light, or the LED, I should say, undulating with the spot. I feel like I'm trying to like burn ants when I'm a kid, or, or leaves, leaves are really easy to burn. Oh yeah, here's a good test. So now we have the flashlight on flicker mode, and so we have it on a black square, but the light ideally shouldn't go off at all. Again, there's a potentiometer, so we can adjust it, but this is pretty good. The trick now is to make sure we have enough light coming through our record to illuminate the spot on the subject to be picked up by the four sensors. 
For this build, we're gonna need to do some motor control. And uh, we've got these two motors that came out of some handheld drills, and they run off these 18 volt NICAD cells. What I've set up is a 555 timer circuit to mimic what was in a trigger. With the circuit, that I've built, it can change the uh, duty cycle and the frequency. So in this example that I have set up here, it's breadboarded. You'll be able to see on the oscilloscope the frequency and the duty cycle, and the um, voltmeter, you'll be able to see the, what the voltage changes to as I turn the potentiometer. So the output from the 555 is gonna go into the gate of the IRL530, and as the frequency changes, that will adjust the speed, the voltage, that goes to the motor, and thus changing the speed. I'm gonna turn this on, I'll show you an example what it looks like on the oscilloscope and with the voltmeter. Here on the oscilloscope is the output from the 555, and here on the voltmeter is the output from the IRL530. And as I change the frequency, right now it's at uh, 98 hertz. It goes up, 200, 330, 1.2 kilohertz, and that changes the voltage at its low from 15 up to 18. And this potentiometer here will change the duty cycle, but I pretty much want to keep it right about where it is, 50% uh, duty cycle, which is about what we'll need. So there's some fine tuning for that. So you're going down to 45, but really it's best at uh, close to 50. That's what we're looking for. Now that this is working, I'm gonna put it onto a proto board. It's time for Felix's Corner. I got this old machine here that I'm gonna use as the vehicle for installing this operating system. Basically, I'm gonna download um, Fedora, put it on a uh, disk drive or a thumb drive, this little unit right here, and then uh, install it, set it up, and voila, you'll see it. So I'm gonna navigate to the Fedora website, and I'll go to Workstation, Download Now. Now that I have the operating system on the thumbstick, we can put it in the machine and boot to it. Now I've just plugged the USB drive into the workstation and I've booted up into the boot device, select boot device mode. You scan this USB flash device. Okay, that's what I want to boot to. All right, and I'm going to start Fedora Live. It's really, really easy to do this. Now it's gonna go through the initial boot process and it's booting off of the USB stick, so it's gonna take a little bit of time. Now that the system has booted and we're at the option to try Fedora or install, we're going to go ahead and install. It's going to ask us a bunch of questions. And keep in mind, it's on the, it's running off of the USB stick, so it's gonna be a little slow, all right? Okay, select the disk installation. So we're gonna choose this device. See, we can just automatically configure partitions. That'd be pretty easy. So now that we have chosen the destination for the install, which is the 300 gig SATA drive here, next we will choose to begin the installation. Now we will sit back and watch the installation. This is as easy as it gets. So when I show you this in the Arch Linux installation, all this is done through a console or terminal, if you will, with text files, rather than this nice, easy, guided GUI. So here is Fedora in all of its glory. The install was very easy. I didn't really have to do much. I just burned a USB stick, plugged it in, booted to it, went through the options, set up a profile, it installed, I logged in, and I have all this stuff right here. And that's how easy it is to install Fedora. Next time, I'm gonna start showing you the steps to install Arch Linux, which is a much more involved process. Until then, see ya.
Okay, here's where we're at. We have the device that throws the spot onto the subject. Karen is going to actually work on that to improve it with a bigger flashlight and a better lens. While she's working on that, I'm going to work on the device that actually reproduces the image. That's going to consist of another motor and another Nipkow disc. But instead of flying the spot, it will just have a light box behind it that will have one source of illumination that will flash, hopefully in sync with the detection of the flying spot on the subject. So that little LED you saw blinking in the last demonstration, we'll hook that up to a big light box here to turn the lights on and off in sync and hopefully reproduce some kind of picture. Okay, we made some marks here to show the angle of the topmost and bottommost hole. Then I also created angular marks here to make the window. So again, we don't want more than one hole in the window at a time. So it's gonna be a pretty small viewing area, but I think we can make it work. So I'm gonna take the record off, manually cut the hole, and then we'll make the light box. All right, we're getting ready to do another test. We created a little box here. Originally, we had a back to it, but we realized that it actually bounced more light than it stopped, so we removed that. The senses are in about 45 degree angle toward the subject, which would be right about here. That'll be where the face goes. So for our first test, we're just gonna spin the record and change the dot pattern on uh, basically blank area, then the whiteboard, and then someone's skin. And if it can work on skin, then I think we're pretty good to go. All right, so nothing bright, nothing bright. So the LED, or the circuit I should say, is reacting to the brightness being bounced back from the flying spot into the four sensors. Hopefully it works at the frequencies we'll need. So, you know, we're gonna be talking very fast, but the persistence of vision will hopefully create some kind of an image. And we're hoping to at least get a face or maybe a hand or something. Or at worst, we just have like, you know, a checkerboard or like a ball or something, you know, it's a very simple shape. So we were about halfway through the mechanical television project where we started running into problems. The first problem we had was that the MOSFETs we were trying to use to drive the DC motors were frying. Turns out a lot of current goes through a handheld drill, even a cheap one like the one that we bought. So what Felix did was he rewired the DC motor controller circuit using the actual MOSFETs from the drill. And that had enough current carrying capacity in order to work. However, I think using DC motors was just kind of a mistake for starters. We probably should have used steppers. Um, they might not have gone as fast, but they would have been, you know, basically perfectly controlled and in sync. So then we had a synchronization problem. Uh, my cheap solution was I wanted to just slow down one of the records manually and kind of hand sync it because, you know, if we had to add opto sensors on each motor, we would have had to either use a microcontroller or make the circuit more complicated. I was trying to do it as simply as possible. So the easy solution for synchronization that Max thought of was to just use a belt. So we had a lot of XL timing belts laying around. We 3D printed a couple pulleys, stuck those onto the records, and then put the belt on in order to try to synchronize it. Um, we had all the separate parts working, but it just didn't come together and give us a proper image. Now it's time for a research update. In an upcoming episode, we're going to be building an automatic doorknob sanitizer to keep doorknobs free of germs and bacteria. I bought one of these handheld UV sanitizing lights, so I'm gonna take it apart, see what's inside of it, draw up a 3D printed design to fit the bulb. And basically, yeah, hopefully it'll go around the doorknob and clean off the bacteria. I also need to order some Petri dishes so we can actually do some scientific tests to see the before and after of a clean and dirty doorknob and how many cultures grow off of it. So stay tuned for that episode. Well, Karen, we tried, but we couldn't get the mechanical television to display a stable image in the time that we had. Well, that's how projects go sometimes. Sometimes you try your darndest and it just doesn't work out. Yeah, but you know, 
I did see some comments in part one. People were like saying, hey, you should do this differently or that's wrong. So I think we should actually open this up to the community at this point. Yeah. Would you like to see us revisit this in the future? And then if so, what would you like to see us do differently? If we get enough good ideas on a path to success with this project, we could revisit it as a future episode. So don't forget to give us those ideas on the Element 14 community on element14.com forward slash TBHS. And you can also go there to read about other upcoming episodes, builds, and special events. We'll see you next time, just not on Mechanical TV. Okay, now that the system is booted, oh no, something has gone wrong. Oh no. Look at the, look at the screen. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I will just log out then. Let's see if we can get some sloth of faction here. <laughs> I can't get no sloth of faction because I try and I try and I try and I try. Felix, I need more sloth of faction on this side. The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com. <laughs>